Hello and welcome to Edison TV. Today I'm joined again by David Richards, founder, CEO and chairman of One Disco, which is one of the UK's fastest growing, if not the fastest growing technology business listed in the UK markets. The company's core technology essentially enables companies to move very large volumes of data to the cloud from customer premise or edge deployments and ultimately between different cloud providers as well without interruption. David, many thanks for joining us again. Is that the right way to describe One Disco? I think that was pretty good, Dan. You've known the company for quite some time. That was, that was pretty accurate. Good stuff. And I wanted to start by really understanding what's changed. Um, you've been an overnight success almost that's been working at this for a very long period of time. Suddenly we've seen this enormous surge in, in deal flow, mainly from IoT applications. Can you discuss what, what the catalysts have been to make that change? Yeah, so I mean, it's, you could, you've summed it up pretty well. So we're, we're a 10 year overnight success. Uh, uh, I suppose I can describe the company in three sentences. We built a product designed to move data at massive scale uh, three, four, five years ago. We looked like a bunch of idiots because the data sets were not there in the magnitude that we need them to be. Along comes 5G. 5G enables IoT sensor data, enables a bandwidth spectrum capable of sending IOC, IoT sensor data uh, from sensor to edge. And to monetize that data, companies have to move it to the cloud because that's where there is exponential compute capability, elastic compute capability. So I uh, saw a really good presentation uh, by the CDO of Jaguar Land Rover who said that their passion uh, was their products, uh, their focus was their customers, but their monetization is their data. And I'll discuss later a little bit about what that means. But in order to monetize this, they have to send it to the cloud. So that, that pipeline that sends data from edge to cloud is that product that we built five years ago. So the thing that changed, the catalyst for this enormous change in this business has been IoT. And suddenly we have data sets that are multiple petabytes, even exabytes in scale. Great, thanks. And I mean, I think you're putting a lot of emphasis on the market, but you know, you've also done quite a lot in terms of the product, in terms of the people. Can you discuss the things that you've done internally to really support that change too? Two things, the, you have to have product market fit, right? So we had the best product at moving data at scale. Without data at scale, you know, there's not a whole lot you can actually do. Um, we also looked at the sales organization very carefully and we're, we changed the entire sales team um, 18 months ago. Um, Hired Dr. Frank Moser, who is one of the original guys over at Google. He closed the first IoT deal in Q4 last year, which was with a large component manufacturer that's for a whole fleet of vehicles, actually. It's an exabyte plus of data. And that sort of caught hold. And that, that sales organization changed the real pace that we were able to do deals at. Understood. And, and then your deal flow this year, I mean, there's been, I guess, a couple of customers where we've seen a lot of follow-on act activity. One of them is a telco, one of, them's a one of them is an automotive component supplier. Can you talk us through the, the dynamics there and, 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 and is that the kind of um, situation we can see repeating it again, again and again? Yeah, I mean, so we see humongous tailwinds in telecommunications, automotive manufacturing, where the fundamental source of competitive advantage across all of those industries is data and the algorithms that query that data. So talking to the CEO of, uh, of one of the world's largest telecommunications companies and people don't really want to pay for cell to cell calls anymore because there's FaceTime and there's WhatsApp and there's a variety of other methods of doing it. So when 5G came into being, many people thought, ah, that's so I can watch uh, videos online. Actually, it's not. It's, it powers B2B for those companies. It, and it means that they are the fundamental backbone of IoT. In automotive, as I alluded to earlier, I've got two Teslas at home. Uh, when we came back to the UK. Neither has been into a shop for, uh, for service and neither has had, has had any parts. That's 50% really of the automotive industry wiped out overnight. So every single automotive company is now focused on filling that gap as they move into EVs. So EVs in Germany, for example, is 5%, it's forecasted to go to 15%. That's a 3x growth in data potential for us. So those, those types of tailwinds are astronomical. So the, your average EV, by the way, in the United States throws off 25 gigabytes of data per hour, per hour. Um, and that's going to grow, as I said, as the number of EVs grows in the market in, in, because of GDPR. 
in the European Union, it's between 10 and 15 gigabytes of data per hour, but astronomical data sets. So the data sets that we're now looking at are multiple petabyte scale. And being the only company genuinely capable of moving those volumes of data, it means that we're taking market share very quickly. And you alluded to deals that we've done that have grown very quickly. So we license on something called commit to consume or consumption. So if you go through the history of software licensing, you had um, perpetual licensing, which is what IBM do. So you basically, companies like IBM do. So you basically own the, the company buys the software, they own it, and then they pay maintenance and support at about 20% every year. Then you had subscription and people get subscription and consumption mixed up. So if you, if you do a three year subscription, that's all you're really gonna get from the customer. If you do consumption, we're asking people to pay for what they actually use. So we didn't invent consumption. Actually, it really came into being with AWS because that's how they license their cloud. Snowflake, for example, is an application that sits on top of the cloud. They license on, on, a, on a consumption basis as well. And it's really important. I wouldn't actually in, probably invest in or manage a company that didn't do consumption because what happens with subscription is somebody comes and says, right, I want an all, it gets to scale. Then they say, right, I want an all that you can eat license. And consumption, you never do that. So we're charging 140, I can say this very confidently because all of our deals are the same, $140,000 per petabyte of data consumed. We recognize revenue when the data is actually consumed and we're very confident that all the deals that we've announced so far are going to consume very quickly. So the telco that, that we announced, one of the world's largest telecommunications companies, we did a deal in Q1 of 1.5 million, a follow-on deal of 1.2 million, then it went to 11.6 million, and then it went to 25 million. Uh, and these are, that's not cumulative, these are individual deals. So about $40 million of, of commit to consume. The use cases there are smart meters um, across Europe, actually. So the way that you control the, it's not so you can check how much, like my dad does, how much it costs to turn light on and off. This is actually looking at the power grid across Europe to reduce power consumption. So the way that you reduce power consumption is using machine learning, and artificial intelligence. So you send electricity to the grid where it needs to be, when it needs to be there, where it needs to be, when it needs to be there. So to avoid shedding, because you lose about 25% of the power across the grid by shedding because power is not in the right places. So machine learning, artificial intelligence there. Others like uh, we announced the deal the other day with a, an auto parts manufacturer. The first deal was, um, you know, 5 million, then 7 million, and then 13.2 million. And that again, as, as their data sets have grown, so they, um, they signed a, a deal with a very large automotive who are going to start charging subscriptions for things like heated seats. Everybody goes, am I really gonna pay for a heated seat? Well, I can tell you're living in the middle of the Peak District or even in London today. If you've got a choice to pay 10 bucks a month, whatever it's going to be for a heated seat, you are gonna press the button. Yeah. So the, 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 those are the types of tailwinds that are driving the business right now. Great, and, and you mentioned in your recent update that your pipeline is at record levels. Um, and you talked about two, two scenarios there, the sort of smart city side, side of things and also um, the automotive. Now, it looks as if there's significant growth in the, both of those two markets uh, in themselves. You know, looking at your pipeline, are there any other, other particular applications that are looking interesting or, or, or should we really focus on those, uh, on those across, key ones? Across the whole economy. So the, if you look at the Gartner Magic Quadrant for IoT, from, for IoT you're going to see... Up and to the right, telecommunications. So we're expecting to do, you know, in our pipeline, we've got probably 10 plus uh, telcos. We have the top of uh, most of the top 10 auto manufacturers, automotive companies, and part suppliers. And then we have, believe it or not, trains. So a, a, a high speed train has to come off the track every third journey for a manual in inspection to ensure that uh, there is no broken parts, et cetera. That's again a machine learning problem. A train, by the way, generates a petabyte of data on average, high-speed train uh, per day, which to us is like $140,000 per day just for a, a single uh, bullet train, high-speed train. Then there's manufacturing, and we're seeing use cases appear in manufacturing very quickly as well. So there's that heat map. So the, the beautiful thing with this company is most of us that have seen enterprise in the past, it's kind of searching for the needle in the haystack. When does somebody need to buy your product? Or how, when are they going to need it? Most of our pipeline is actually inbound to us. So we're kind of well known in the industry now as being the only solution to this problem. Not when I say the industry, I'm talking about the IoT industry. Most people know about most of the deals that we've done and who we've done them with. 
So we don't have this enormous cost base that you typically see with enterprise. So I need thousands of people in marketing to scale my sales, you know, to scale bookings to where it, you know, to 75 million where it is today. I'm, I, you know, we, we're still, we still haven't closed this quarter, so I would expect more to come, as we said in the recent announcement. We don't need to scale the sales organization. We don't need to add operating costs into the business like you typically see. So, you know, we're, we're really focused on turning this business into a highly profitable company in the short term. Exciting times. Can you talk about your, your partner ecosystem? You've always had an enviable list of partners, you know, the hyperscalers, the Microsofts, Googles, Amazons, Oracles, and so on. Uh, and obviously you've got these customers, the automotive companies, the um, uh, telcos and so on. But can you, can you discuss how that partner ecosystem is actually working for you nowadays? Yeah, so it, I would argue that we got it slightly wrong, actually. So we did we had very, you know, first party service with Microsoft and with AWS and strategic deals with Oracle. They're paying their customers to use our products. They're really the equivalent of oil to the airline industry. So if you're... If you're an airline, you want the most reliable supply at the lowest possible cost. And that's what compute is. So compute really is the oil, um, excuse the analogy, but is really the oil to the IoT industry. It provides the, the kerosene that's going to power all of these use cases. So what most of our customers in IoT need is complete sovereignty or independence over their own data. So you know, the quote I gave you from the chief data officer of Jaguar Land Rover, if that is going to be their business is monetizing their data, you're not going to take it and plug a pipeline forever into a single cloud. You're going to arbitrage between clouds if what I said is correct, which I think it is. But our power is that we have deep integrations with the cloud vendors. We're sending more data than we're sending the world's largest data sets to the cloud at massive scale. So they're happy with us. And our customers are really happy because they can arbitrage between clouds. So they can unplug from AWS, for example, and plug into Azure. So that's what utility computing really is all about. So it's like you know plugging a, an appliance into a wall socket to get electricity. It's the same thing. Yeah, I get you. Um, and you know, I guess looking, looking over the next, next 12 to 24 months, you've got an enormous pipeline as you've discussed. How do you prioritize that? How are you setting your key priorities over the next 12 to 24 months? So the initial so RPO, which means remaining performance obligation, which is basically a form of deferred revenue um, that sits out there, turning that into revenue by driving consumption. That then drives, you know, obviously significant revenue growth, keeping our, our cost base, you know, roughly where it is today, plus or minus. So our focus is, is going to be growing the top line maintaining a, um, a, uh, a, a relatively low cost base and then being valued on earnings, which most people who've known Wandisco for a period of time would scarcely believe. But I can assure you that we're going to be profitable growth. This company will be exponentially growing, but profitably. Exciting times ahead. David, many thanks for coming in again. Thank you.